Uh, good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, today's Grand Round uh, is presented by Hugh, Dr. Hugh Traquar. Uh, Dr. Dr. Traquar is a uh, recent addition to the uh, Department of Medicine uh, and the Division of GIM. He's a general internist um, who uh, uh, trained here at McMaster uh, and did his fellowship training here at McMaster as well. Uh, today, Dr. Traquar will be talking to us about point-of-care ultrasound uh, and simulation. Uh, so uh, welcome, Hugh. Thank you, Dr. Tanju, for that uh, warm introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Um, great. Uh, so I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. So I want to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Uh, this territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Uh, so, as Dr. Kanju mentioned, um, I'm a recent hire and my academic interests are in simulation training and point of care ultrasound. Uh, I'm going to narrow that somewhat uh, for today's talk because those are large topics that we can't really go over in a one hour session. Um, and I thought it would be useful to look at ways where we can incorporate simulation training into the teaching that we're already doing every single day. Um, because of the nature of my work and um, the things that simulation is best at, it's maybe a little bit inpatient medicine centric, but I think there are lessons that we can all pull from simulation training uh, that apply to the outpatient setting just as easily. I have no disclosures. Um, my only disclosure, this is something I'm interested in um, and nobody's paying me extra for this, essentially. Uh, so the objectives today are uh, we're going to go through what simulation is, the, some of the principles behind it, and uh, the evidence base and support. Um, we're going to talk about some ways that we can take those principles and apply them to the teaching that we're already doing. Uh, and I'm going to explore a bit how simulation can help us provide actionable feedback uh, that our trainees can put to use immediately. So what is healthcare simulation? What am I actually talking about? Uh, you can see an incredibly helpful definition from the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. Uh, I'm being a little unfair here. Their definition does go on, but there is no universally accepted definition. Uh, in general, it involves the recreation of an acute medical scenario that is worked through step by step yeah. And, and it's in an attempt to be as realistic as it can be based on the resource and time restrictions at hand. Um, so some examples. This is one example of simulation. Uh, I took this photo from the CSBL website. I hope they don't mind. That's the Center for Simulation Based Learning um, at the uh, Health Sciences Center at McMaster. So this is an example of high fidelity simulation where there are many elements that are working together to make this as realistic as possible. So this is a trauma surgery simulation. You have here a surgical team in appropriate sterile gowns with caps on. You likely have, I think there's probably more people off to the left, but surgeons, nurses, you've got either, um, another nurse or uh, part of the anesthesia team here. You've got part of the anesthesia team here. You have, this is a working IV pump. These are actual IV fluids running through actual IVs. They run into the mannequin. The mannequin's wearing a seat collar. They have applied makeup to the mannequin. There are IV fluids, pressure bags, bag of simulated blood. Off to the side that we can't see, there are monitors. There's a two-way mi mirror allowing people to observe. These are often recorded. This is the highest fidelity simulation that is possible. Um, and 
clearly requires a lot of time and resources, uh, incredibly valuable learning experiences. What, what else counts as simulation though? Well, you can have lower fidelity simulation too. Uh, so you can have something as simple as a mannequin uh, allowing for more realistic uh, simulation of CPR uh, as part of BLS or ACLS training, um, as long as there's a scenario around it and other things happening. Simply using a mannequin for practicing the skill of CPR is not simulation, uh, but if it's included within a larger scenario, that's one example of a low fidelity simulation where it's, it's not as realistic. It doesn't have all of the things that the high fidelity sim does, but you can achieve some of the same goals. More recently, there's been increasing interest in virtual simulation. So this is an example of, it's a screenshot from a virtual sim platform that we're using here at McMaster in the internal medicine residency program. Um, you know, don't look too closely and peek, uh, but it was based on a system designed by uh, Dr. Sarah Fui, who is an ER doc in Trillium, does some lectures at U of T, um, and adapted by one of our um, residents, uh, Dr. Shannon Gui. And the idea here is it's sometimes hard to get a bunch of people together to do a simulation learning event, especially since COVID started. So here we try to simulate as much of it as possible. You have a patient, you have oxygen supplies, this ECG tracing actually traces in the actual live version. The monitors can be updated. There are equipment uh, pieces here. If you want an IV, you have to take the IV and put it on the patient. If you want a medication, you have to write down the order, go to another slide, drag the medication over. Is this the same as this? No, but with the right facilitation and debriefing, this can provide some of the benefits of a simulation training experience. So when I think about what healthcare simulation is and where its value comes from, uh, I, I think it's an imitation of reality and it should be providing learners with an experience where they can get feedback in a safe environment in something where it's hard to do that if it's real life. So simulation works great for high acuity events, high complexity events emotionally stressful events. Sometimes we um, add in complicating factors where there's an upset family because that is like real life. And rare events. You don't want somebody's first experience managing a particular problem like a um, situation where they cannot bag mass ventilation and cannot intubate a patient. You don't want that to be on a real life patient which is why simulation is big in the anesthesia and ER world, because you should get practice doing a rare critical event like that before it actually takes place. So why do we care? What's the point? Well, I'll do a brief digression into some medical education theories here. Um, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but I did want to share for the uh, med ed people um, who are joining us. So. There are a few things that you can use in simulation that play into particular learning theories. So the cycle of doing an action, reflecting on it, trying to do better, uh, works very well with the experiential learning and reflective practice theories. Um, simulation is also used on a more narrow basis for task training. So deliberate practice and mastery learning would apply to things like simulated central line insertion or um, simulated airway management, where you can practice a skill again and again until um, it's done correctly. Um, adult learning theory and gamification are not necessarily always uh, useful in sim or the same as simulation, but uh, gamification in particular will be coming up later, and I'll talk more about it uh, at that point. So we'll never use all of these when we're designing simulation experiences, but they're useful to keep in mind. Unfortunately, the evidence to support the value of simulation uh, is generally weak. Um, studies are extremely heterogeneous. They are mostly small. Um, as an example, one of the meta-analysis uh, reviews that was done of simulation um, training outcomes, the studies included 
had a risk of bias ranging from high to they didn't report enough features to even assess the risk of bias. That's the literature that we're dealing with right now in large part because education is a very difficult thing to study in a methodologically sound way. Uh, there have been some advances in recent years, a lot of them spearheaded at McMaster, but it takes time for literature to be written, for studies to be done, and for evidence to uh, develop. That being said, there is some evidence that high fidelity sim is associated with better learning outcomes. Uh, this is across a few different professions, not just MDs, um, but obviously it requires more time and resources. If you think about that simulation at the beginning of the talk, where I showed the picture of the CSBL with, you know, four different healthcare providers visible, clearly a lot of prep time went into that. Uh, you get better learning outcomes and there's a cost to it. Um, other sim activities uh, have been shown in some cases to be associated with better engagement and motivation, uh, not necessarily better learning outcomes. Uh, and some of these studies, you know, particularly in the virtual simulation world, uh, are of the nature where a company comes up with a product and then does a study showing that uh, their product is better than doing nothing. Not the most helpful. Um, those studies do tend to show improved learning uh, outcomes compared with doing absolutely nothing. But when um, low fidelity and virtual sim are compared to other learning activities, typically so far the literature mostly supports better engagement and motivation, not necessarily better learning outcomes. That being said, I think engagement and motivation are important when we're trying to teach. Uh, I think it's useful to have multiple tools in our toolkit. Um, simulation cannot and should not be applied to every possible teaching opportunity. But if the right time comes up, it's useful to have the ability to introduce some simulation uh, just as another means of introduction. I also find it pretty fun. Um, I don't know if that's also true of the trainees who go through simulation, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very engaging and uh, mentally active form of teaching. Everybody gets very involved. So how does simulation actually work? How do you get from um, a planning stage to something like that CSBL scenario? What is actually happening what are they doing? How is this contributing to learning? These are the questions that I'm going to answer in this section. Typically, there are three phases to a simulation. I'll run through all three because the principles at play are things that we can use in our everyday teaching. Uh, so much of what we're going to talk about here can be useful, even if you are not running a full scale simulation. So first I'll talk about the pre-briefing. This is an absolutely necessary part of any simulation. Uh, the goals and objectives are the, of the simulation should be clearly laid out. Um, you do not need to explain every step of the simulation. There should be surprises and twists and turns, but learners should know that they are going to be managing a sick patient. They should know that the goals of the simulation are medical management and crisis resource management, which we'll talk about more. You also want to create a learning environment where people feel safe. They need to be able to feel like they can grow and develop, like they can make mistakes and not be uh, judged as incompetent by their colleagues, because this is often done in a group setting. And you also want to try to get everyone to buy into the scenario and treat it as a real, because Everyone will have a lot more fun if they treat it at real and it, it avoids the phenomenon where people are sort of pretending to do something and looking at each other and chuckling, which breaks the immersion and compromises the learning. Uh, I'm going to reemphasize this because it's such an important part of simulation. Um, this is the basic assumption, which uh, was actually created and trademarked by the Center for Medical Simulation uh, at Harvard. Um, but the basic idea behind running a simulation is that you want everyone in the room to agree that everyone participating 
is smart, good at their job, and they're there because they want to get better at their very important job. Um, I'm not talking about running OSCEs here where there is a summative evaluation component. I'm talking about an attempt to make a group of people better at their jobs where their job is extremely important and we can all improve. That is the safe learning environment and the basic assumption that we're trying to uh, instill with during a pre-briefing. So next up is the scenario. Um, this generally involves multiple stages where learners progress through the stages based on the actions that they take, or sometimes based on um, just time elapsing. Typically, things should be realistic where possible, and uh, simulation really benefits from exploring crisis resource management. So what am I talking about? Not everyone in this webinar may be familiar with the term. Crisis resource management involves all of the things in a critical situation which are not medical management. So being aware of what's happening in the room, knowing who can do what, knowing what resources you have, which ones you need to go get and how to go get them, knowing how to communicate in a clear fashion so that everyone is on the same page and everyone knows what they are doing. It involves leadership and creating a team that can work together, even if none of the people on that team have ever met or worked together before. Um, and it involves knowledge about how you manage tasks and how your own decision making works so you can avoid um, traps like premature closure. Um, and, you know, all of these work together in a crisis um, to allow for a good outcome. For the purposes of this talk, Crisis resource management involves a lot of things. We are mainly going to focus on situational awareness because I think it is the thing that we can most easily and seamlessly fold into our teaching. So finally, there's the debrief. This is also vitally important. Um, most resources and experts that you consult would say, if you're not doing a debriefing, do not bother doing a simulation. Um, a debriefing is designed to defuse tension as its first phase because simulation, even with the right pre-briefing, even with a safe learning environment, it's stressful. Um, I say that as someone who has been a participant in sim since becoming an attending, it's stressful. Uh, and it may mimic situations that people have been in in their real life, um, whether as a healthcare provider or um, a family member, you never know what reaction you're going to get. So there's always an attempt to defuse that tension and let emotions come out and be explored. Then there's an opportunity to review everything that happened within the scenario among all the participants so that everyone walking out agrees on what happened. If people walk out of the room and compare notes and think different things happened, the debriefing was not successful. And then there's an opportunity to identify uh, what can be improved. This allows for really good real-time feedback. Um, the debriefing happens right after the scenario. And as they've been going through the scenario, the learners have been getting feedback simply by the way the scenario evolves. They give a medication and things change or things don't change if it was the, uh, an ineffective treatment or they get worse if it was an actively harmful treatment. So there is a lot of feedback and depending on the simulation, there's sometimes an opportunity to immediately try again. This is a model called uh, rapid cycling um, where you essentially, if a mistake is made or something isn't done optimally, the situation is stopped, very rapid debrief, start over and do it again. And that's repeated until it's done correctly. Uh, we don't always do that. It's generally more for procedures um, than our more uh, scenario-based simulations, but it is an option. How do you do a debrief? Well, many people have many different ways to help you do a good debrief. This is an incomplete list of methods and models and schema to help conduct a debrief. Um, the important thing is to do a debrief consistently um, in a way that you're comfortable with and in a way that helps your learners get what they need to get out of the scenario. 
Um, a lot of it depends on how much time you have, the expertise of your learners. So learning how to debrief is a uh, expertise of its own, which I am still building. But in general, a good debrief starts with a good pre-brief. If you haven't laid out expectations and created an environment where people feel okay being vulnerable about their skills and uh, opening up about mistakes that may have made, you are not gonna have a good debrief. Um, so as I described earlier, you need to allow room for emotions to come out and often debriefs start with a simple reaction. Like, how does everyone feel? You know, good, bad, angry, frustrated, disappointed in myself. You get a lot of different emotional reactions and validating and discussing those as a group makes people understand their own reactions better. It helps them um, in similar situations in the future and it allows you to move on without that hanging over the entire group. Then we generate that shared mental model often by having learners debrief each other. So with the right group, you can have a set of trainees talk amongst themselves, compare notes, the facilitator adjudicates any disagreements, but together they walk through what happened step by step, minute by minute, until everyone is on the same page. And then with that description of what happened, you go through it and you use commentary to help build that learning. So you want to focus on what could be improved for next time, because that's why we're doing this. Uh, and it's often a great opportunity to identify issues related to crisis resource management, um, process, communication, and situational awareness that people in the room may not have identified. As an example of how uh, a debrief could respond to feedback, this is again pulled from the virtual simulation. Uh, and there's you know a few things to comment on with these orders. Um, so it's always important to focus on key learning things and you know not let people leave with an incorrect understanding of medical management but that's often not the focus so i really hope that the people who did the sim did not leave thinking that 10 milligrams of intramuscular epinephrine was a good dose to give um but that's something that should be called out corrected but is not necessarily the focus of the debrief because there's not much to talk about there. It shouldn't be 10 milligrams. It should be 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. Not a lot of discussion. But if you had a trainee come in and say, you know, I need one in a thousand epinephrine, 10 milligrams given intramuscular times two, I need ENT and anesthesia, I need IV fluids, I need an IO line, I need Benadryl. The other people in the simulation should be identifying what who's doing what how are we implementing this what is your top priority what should we do first this is also something that works really really well in interprofessional settings because then you get a better understanding of other people's work so when we're running through say a royal college scenario which is not exactly the same as sim the correct way to do a Royal College scenario often involves rattling off a set of instructions. We want this blood work, we want this in terms of imaging, we want a number of medications, we want this. That is the correct way to do a Royal College scenario. It is not the correct way to do a sim. If you go into a simulation and you try to implement that and you're in an interprofessional setting, the nurses and RTs and porters will look at you and say, I'm so confused about what you want. So much of the time, the focus in a debrief is on the crisis resource management and not necessarily on the medical actions that were carried out. So there are many different objectives of simulation training. Some resources give up to 12. Uh, I'm gonna focus on three that I think we can bring into our everyday teaching in a fairly seamless, low effort way um, and try to make things hopefully a little better. I don't wanna make them worse, that's for sure. How are we gonna use this? It all sounds great, I hope, but it needs to be put into action. So this is going to be a bit CTU centric. Again, that's where I do most of my clinical work. 
Um, but if you don't primarily work on the CTUs, I would encourage you to think about as I'm going through these examples, how it can be applied to your setting, whether it's um, outpatient or non-CTU inpatient, consult team, um, home visits, whatever you do in your practice. But on the CTU, there are many opportunities to do teaching. There's handover in the morning and throughout the week, there are many, many, many different um, teaching sessions that happen. And these are not all appropriate to have SIM principles incorporated. If you have clerks who are trying to learn about heart failure for the first time, please do not give them a high fidelity simulation of a heart failure patient. That is too much all at once. It will teach the wrong things. But I think there are some opportunities to include simulation that can work for people of all training levels. So specifically, I'm gonna talk about how we teach on the CTU. Um, some bedside teaching options, SMR teaching, and how we teach at Code Blues. Uh, and with the right objectives and the right attitude and framing, this can work for learners no matter their stage. Uh, so I'm going to start with something we can do no matter what teaching session we're doing, which is a pre-briefing. And we'll talk about teaching sim situational awareness during bedside teaching in Code Blues. Um, then a little bit of gamification and some multi-stage scenarios that could be useful during CTU teaching. And finally, how we can incorporate debriefing principles into our feedback um, in our everyday lives. So pre-briefing, the benefits are not confined to just simulation. Um, I think there's huge value in going over goals and objectives. I think the safe learning environment attitude of simulation can be really beneficial in generating discussion. So when I'm trying to get a group engaged, um, you know, we're doing hyponatremia, every off-service residence uh, dream teaching scenario. I like to get people involved by asking them for wrong answers. You know, populate a multiple choice quiz for me. Then people can throw out options without worrying that their IV fluid should have been 50 mils an hour and not 75. I just want them thinking and wrong answers will promote incredible discussion. Um, you know, most of us who are, um, you know, I hope uh, junior residents plus, given that the junior residents are close to seniors, would not use oral ciprofloxacin as a first line agent septic shock. But why? Well, it's not necessarily coverage and you don't know that they're going to absorb it, what happens if they vomit in 20 minutes, a multitude of reasons. If you never explore the wrong answers, then people don't know why they're wrong and don't understand the principles underneath them. I also like to emphasize the formative nature of assessment. You know, you've got your med student who's really hoping to get a reference letter from you and is afraid to be wrong in front of you. You want them to feel that if you are assessing them, it is for their learning and growth. And you're not gonna think, well, they were wrong. This goes in their reference letter that they didn't know um, about this piece of trivia. So those are things I like to do. And I think pre-briefing does have benefits, even if you're just doing a chalk talk um, in your everyday work. Next up is situational awareness. So this can be taught during bedside teaching uh, or during code blues. Uh, I think it's a little harder to incorporate into other settings in part because teaching this requires some complexity in the environment, which you can't always generate in a clinic room. Um, I just did a day of the ambulatory CTU at McMaster yesterday, very complex patients, but they're all in the same, rooms with the same equipment, there isn't necessarily as much to review. Uh, situational awareness is a really valuable skill because you want trainees to be able to step back from a complex problem and take in everything that is happening. And you want them to be able to examine an unwell inpatient, which is a different skill from examining someone who's unwell in other settings. Um, as I think uh, many of you will agree with and we'll see when we talk through this next, next example. So we have a classic internal medicine bedside teaching opportunity. We have a patient with decompensated cirrhosis. Excellent. Bring the team into the room. We check them for ascites. 
to go through the likelihood ratios, which are good tests, what's a less good test, sensitivity, specificity. Do they have asterixis? Do they have skin changes? Do they have temporal wasting? Many, many things to look at in this patient. Great teaching opportunity. And then you leave the room and nobody knows if they had an IV in situ. Nobody knows how much urine output was in their Foley catheter. Nobody knows if they were on oxygen. Nobody knows if they ate anything off their tray. Um, nobody looked at the IV fluids and the medications that have been given recently. These are the types of things that you can teach using complicated inpatients because they have more of these things to look at. It's not necessarily taught as part of the physical exam, but it is a vital skill, particularly when assessing an acutely unwell inpatient. If you look at uh, inpatient physicians, uh, you know, ER docs included who look after patients in the, you know, often up to 12 hours after they've been admitted and they're still sitting in the ER, um, critical care, GIM, many different specialties. The assessment includes all of these things and it's not always taught early in training. So this is something that we can teach very easily without really changing our practice very much. There's also opportunities here around code blues. So in this scenario, I'm not talking about the, you know, people in the CPR lineup, the SMR leading the code, the IM or ICU staff assisting them. I'm talking about going to the code and staying way out of the way. We all know during the daytime, 40 to 50 people show up. It's often a crowd control mess, but even staying far enough away that you're not cluttering the environment, there's a lot to learn from a code blue. So we can go over with our teams and we can think, who is everyone present? Are people identifying themselves? Is it clear from their identification who can do what? Does everyone know what they should be doing? If somebody asks for a medication, is it asked into the air or is it asked to a specific person who knows where to find that medication? When they go to get that medication, is it in the right place? Do they have to open multiple different trays on the crash cart? If they need something from down the hall, how does that communication get reviewed? So there's a lot of crisis resource management skills that can be explored just by observing a critical incident like a code blue without being in the room because that's a completely different um, skill set to teach. And you know, I think most of us, if we're in the room in a code blue, there's already lots of opportunities for teaching. Next, I'm gonna talk a bit about gamification. So uh, brief digression into what that is, is it's the act of taking uh, a serious learning activity. And in medicine, we're, we're learning about pretty serious stuff and introducing parts of games into it. It's designed to foster increased engagement and motivation. It creates competition, it creates teamwork. Uh, and it's similar to SIM in that it has opportunities for repeat exposure and actions are linked with their consequences. So it's not the exact same thing as simulation, but they do share a few commonalities and it's possible to do both. So what, what would this look like on an inpatient ward, for example? Well, say during CTU-wide or SMR teaching, um, I'm going to uh, give credit here to Dr. Zara Khaled uh, at St. Joe's who did the first session like this that I can remember when I was a trainee. Um, where people were put into groups and she added an additional motivating tactic, which was candy. So extrinsic motivators also can work very well during teaching. Um, but essentially in this type of teaching scenario, learners are split into groups. Each group is mixed. You have clerks, you have juniors, you may have an SMR, although they should generally not be involved until a little bit later, but these teams, are competing to manage the same patient. They all get the same information up front and they have to write specific orders. The case then evolves, not really based on what they were doing because each team will do something different, but a new event happens. The patient with septic shock now is oozing from their IV sites and their coagulation studies are abnormal. And the teams have to shift from sepsis management to workup and management of DIC. 
And at each stage, the winner gets a treat. Um, in Dr. Khaled's case, she was giving them um, at one point full-size chocolate bars. So there was stiff competition in that teaching session. Now, bringing back this example, because it was a ready-made example of orders, these are not specific. You can't go into Epic and write IV fluid and have that implemented. The orders must be specific and the trainees should be challenged if they are not specific enough. Um, IV fluid run over how long? Is this a wide open bolus? Is it over an hour, two hours? What would you actually like to happen? There should also be some elements of crisis resource management. So IV access is rarely as much as we would like. We rarely have as many nurses as we would like. Specialists are great, uh, but I'm gonna use an example of a GI bleed here. Um, say you have a patient with varices who develops a GI bleed. Your learner may ask for a blood transfusion, IV fluids, fresh fro frozen plasma, octreotide infusion, ceftriaxone, pantoprazole infusion. That's a good set of interventions. The patient has two IVs. How are you going to prioritize that? How are you going to get access? Are there some medications that are more important than others? Are there some things that, you know, you can give ceftriaxone quickly, free up the IV, and then give an infusion? These are the types of real world problems that you can introduce when doing this type of instruction. You know, in Royal College scenarios, you know, you call for specialists, always do this. But in a similar scenario, if you call, GI for this patient who is having a variceal hemorrhage, even if you call them stat and they reply stat, they may be doing another emergent endoscopy. They are on citywide call, so it takes them time to arrive. They are not going to be outside the room with an endoscope in two minutes ready to go, no matter how excellent our GI staff are. Things take time and those issues should be built in so that trainees are not surprised when that happens in real life. And then afterwards, there's a great opportunity to do a debrief, um, to go through with the groups what happened, why, what was the scenario actually about, and what were the big learning goals. Uh, the last thing I'd like to go through for um, our you know, implementation of SIM on our everyday, in our everyday lives is how to do debriefing and feedback um, in a natural way as part of our everyday routine. So it doesn't matter what type of teaching you do, a debrief of some sort can be helpful. Um, it's important to refer back to the pre-briefing. You know, what were our goals and objectives? Did we meet those? Does everyone understand what this was about? Um, and it's also a great opportunity to normalize mistakes, particularly in teaching. Uh, anyone who's done any uh, sim with me, they may have heard the story of um, a mistake I made in a simulation as a fellow. Um, it was a patient who was um, at a term pregnancy and had a cardiac arrest. Um, and I couldn't remember which direction to displace the uterus during CPR. Simulation and teaching are great places to make mistakes that do not harm patients. I am never going to forget the correct answer to that because I did that in front of a group of peers and colleagues. They were very supportive. No one thought I was a bad doctor because of it, but you remember. And that's the type of thing that we are trying to get uh, for our learners, a mistake or a learning opportunity without patient harm. It's also important to focus on key points, generally whether they were achieved or not. If the scenario is anaphylaxis and the key points that you want to drive home are, you know, crisis resource management, like finding the right setting and getting new IV access for them, early epinephrine and calling an airway expert right away. Maybe don't talk about how their Benadryl dosing was wrong. Maybe don't talk about details of steroid dosing. These are things that are not driving at the core objective. Uh, so whether or not they were done right, the focus should be on what your objectives were. So if the learner did all of their crisis resource management correctly, gave epinephrine exactly as they should have, and called for anesthesia and ENT right away, great. Those successes should be emphasized 
and driven home so that everyone comes away knowing what the goals were. If those things were done incorrectly or suboptimally, there's an opportunity for learning and growth. You emphasize that, drive it home and move on. So always coming back to the key points, I think is very important. There is also an opportunity to do some debriefing after real scenarios, but I think we need to be very careful here. Um, debriefing was initially designed um, in part as a response to actual traumatic events happening. So uh, the term comes from debriefing after combat during wartime. Uh, it was also implemented after traumatic or stressful events for first responders um, and victims of incidents to help unpack emotions and attempts to uh, stop PTSD from developing. Um, and it can be applied in a similar fashion. I think it's very important to be careful with the way this is done. Um, unlike other teaching sessions with debriefs, peer feedback should be very limited unless it's a team that knows each other very well and you know everyone is going to be supportive because you don't want you know, your SMR who just ran a code to receive a whole bunch of feedback on things that other people think they did wrong from their peers right after the fact. That is helpful to nobody. Um, generally, it's likely more helpful to focus on crisis resource management and how decisions were made as opposed to details of medical care, especially when we're still, it's often done right after the event and the final outcome is not known. So it's not always obvious if a medical decision was correct or not because you don't know what happened the next day. Um, but you can explore some of the CRM issues. So if you're talking with um, your trainee and you know, the patient went to the ICU, it was a successful code, they survived, but the trainee, you know, had some issues with, you know, they asked a nurse to get medications and the nurse couldn't find the meds. And then when they got the amiodarone, they couldn't give it, didn't know how to mix the infusion and all this stuff. It's, you know, a, an opportunity to have them help them understand that not all nurses have the same scope and skill set and asking a critical care nurse to do some of those tasks might have made things a little bit smoother. Emphasis on the fact that, you know, very rarely is that the sort of thing that affects a patient outcome. Um, it's more about efficiency and making life easier and smoother the next time they have to run a code. So that's how I would use debriefing in these situations. Um, and it's not always appropriate to even get into some of the feedback. You may simply want to have a debrief where the scenario is unpacked, emotions come out, everyone develops a shared mental model and stop there and defer uh, discussions about areas of improvement until later. So I'm gonna wrap things up so that we have time for questions and commentary, but I, I do think simulation can be useful in what we do every single day. Um, I think the key principles that apply to us in our setting is using a pre-briefing to make a safe learning environment, um, using scenarios to teach crisis resource management with a focus on situational awareness and giving feedback and doing a debriefing right afterwards to promote learning and growth. Um, this takes time, it takes mental effort, but I think it does have significant rewards. Uh, so, that's the end of my talk. I would be happy to uh, take any questions or comments. Thanks, Dr. Traquar, um, for that uh, grand rounds on a very important educational topic. Uh, so just to reiterate, if anybody has any questions, either you can raise your hand or uh, put the questions in the Q&A. Uh, and there's already one question uh, by Dr. Jones. Uh, so the question is, how do you reconcile the need for constructive feedback with the need to quantify performance for external educational requirements? That's a great question that I don't think has a perfect answer. Um, I think in some sense, it depends on what you are trying to achieve with a given educational scenario. So, um, the, when we're doing a full scale sim, so if you uh, think about the uh, CSBL type simulation, 
Um, that is a high stress, high stakes environment. And if you are trying to use that to help someone learn and grow, then I, I don't think it's the right place for external education requirements. Now, there are obviously, there, there's a huge need to assess people to make sure that they're on the right track and to um, give them, you know, a, hopefully a passing grade. Um, OSCE is an example of a simulated scenario with an explicit summative assessment. So this is a scenario where people go in knowing that what they do matters for their overall curricular assessment. Um, I think not everything needs to be part of a summative assessment. Um, and I think the most important thing is making it clear if that is part of your goals for the session. So I think it's fair um, in everyday teaching to do uh, a simulation that has a summative component. If you are um, observing one of your ICU fellows, a PGY-6, who has done simulation, managed acutely on well patients frequently. Uh, I'm not an expert in ICU training, but I think it would be fair to give them a high fidelity simulation with the explicit goal of doing a summative assessment and using that in their external education requirements, but they should know that going in. They should know what the focus is um, so that they can be mentally prepared for that. Um, we, a lot of the information we gather um, about our learners comes naturally from the way they do consults, report to us, that sort of thing. Um, and there's always an implied summative component there. Um, but I, I would say for dedicated teaching scenarios, I think we should just be explicit about whether we're doing formative or summative assessments would be my shorter answer. Uh, thanks. Um... Dr. Trucker, is there any other uh, questions? Um, uh, while we're waiting for any additional questions, um, I'm just wondering, and I think you alluded this, to this in your last answer, uh, Hugh, um, with uh, simulation training, do you see this becoming more as part of standardized exams? Um, you described OSCEs, which are sometimes a little bit um, uh, artificial, and the simulations becoming more real world, do you see the potential for a shift to more formal um, national exams uh, within university medical school exams, moving towards some more simulation to be integrated? I think there's potential for that. Um, I think much of that depends on what level of training we are talking about. Um, because the example I gave Dr. Jones was a seasoned PGY-6 ICU fellow where the complexity of a high fidelity sim is valuable both for assessing their performance and for providing them with teaching. Um, I, you know, thinking back to myself as say a PGY-1, if I was doing a PGY-1 OSCE, I know they're not done in September, but let's say they were, you know, a few months in, that much complexity um, in an examination format, I think would not have the same benefits. I think there's a risk that you would not gather the right information about your learner. So I think, you know, hopefully we can come up with ways of making our um, OSCE type examinations more realistic and more useful for extracting the information that we want about the learner and about their skills. Uh, but I think it has to be targeted based on their level and their abilities. Thank you. Um, we've got a question uh, from Dr. Cox. Thank you, Hugh, for a very informative presentation. Uh, we might incorporate elements of simulation into our delivery of clinical care is an interesting prospect. It may not be possible to teach an, an old dog new tricks, but I find this to be an exciting and challenging uh, prospect. So that was just a, uh, sounds like a comment. Any advice uh, for attendings? Um, I think this is not, uh, you know, if there are elements of simulation that can be useful 
in your everyday practice, I think it's a great idea to incorporate them. Um, I don't think everyone should try to be an expert in this, just as I am not an expert in every possible teaching modality. I think we all have our roles to play. Um, and, you know, when we're trying to um, incorporate some of these elements, I think the ability to figure out what your learner needs and what the most appropriate teaching modality might be is probably the most important skill of all. Like, you know, I may, I'm planning to continue developing as a simulation provider, but if I apply that skill set to every single learner, I'm going to be a bad educator. Um, and similarly, other people have other skill sets. There are people who are much better at chalk talks or um, Q and A's than I am. And if they try to apply that format to every single learner, it won't be effective. So, you know, I, I don't think this is a necessarily a huge must have for every educator for every scenario. Thanks. Um, just seeing if there's any other questions. Um, oh, Dr. Ragavan has her hand raised. I'm just going to allow her to ask. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Thanks, Hugh. That was really interesting. I was just wondering about the like continuing education aspect, because a, a few of us attendings have had discussions about how you know, during training, you do all the, the procedures, you get good at them, and then you hit practice and you spend all your time supervising the residents. And the last time you actually got your hands in there, you know, becomes longer and longer ago, unless it's something very complicated. So it seems like doing these sims every so often might be a way to just make sure your hand memory is actually what it used to be. That is an excellent thought. Um, I haven't gone too far in exploring this idea, but I have been looking into uh, becoming an ACLS trainer, both so that we can provide some ACLS to our medicine residents, but also potentially, you know, it would be useful, I think, to have many of us, including myself, get refreshed on uh, that type of skill every so often. And incorporating more um, CME uh, is uh, also a great idea. Um, I'd be happy to uh, look into that further. Uh, thank you. Um, any other um, questions? Well, Dr. Troquar, uh, thank you uh, again for this uh, very important topic. Uh, and I think it, it provoked some, some very interesting discussion. Um, wishing everybody a, a good day. And uh, I'll be uh, ending this uh, rounds. Thank you very much. Happy Thursday. Thank you, Dr. Vandu.